So uh, welcome to Building Online Community for Trans and Queer Jews. I'm Chava de Cordova and I'll be giving this workshop. So I'm just gonna say a little bit to introduce myself before we get going. And you may be wondering who I am if you don't know me. So uh, my first outing as a Jewish teacher was to run a Beit Midrash in Washington State Prisons, which was called Beit Midrash Behind Bars where we created Jewish learning opportunities for incarcerated people all over the state in different prisons. Um, I am trans, queer, disabled, Sephardi, Mizrahi, and I use she, her pronouns. I live on Narragansett land in Providence, Rhode Island, and I am the co-host of the first ever Queer Talmud podcast, which is entitled, Hi, How Are You? And I also, thank God, co-founded Shelma Allah, which is an online first queer yeshiva, which I co-founded with Binya Koatz, who, thank God, is blessing us with her presence here today, um, which I did not know would be happening. So I'm very, uh, I don't know what the word is, pleased, joyful. Um, so that is a little bit about me. So the way that participation is going to work in this workshop is that I'm going to, at various times throughout the workshop, pose some questions. And instead of having people come off mute, I'm just going to ask you to share your answers in the chat. And I'll sort of pick some things out of the chat to share with everyone. So the first thing I want to talk about before we dive into my life and experience with online community this year is I want to hear from you all, what kinds of digital events or spaces have you been in this year? And how did those spaces feel for you? So while you're concocting those answers and putting them in the chat, I'm going to talk a little bit about what my year was like in digital experiences. Um, one really amazing opportunity I had this year was that I taught a Mishnah class which was a collaboration between a local conservative synagogue in Providence, Rhode Island, and um, just sort of trans Jews from all over the internet. And something that felt so special and alive to me about being in that space was that it was a place where people from different generations and really different cultural groups were um, were connecting and studying Jewish texts together, which um, is not something, it's rare even in in-person community, even more so in online community. I haven't gotten many opportunities to see that kind of cross-communal connection, and I really love it. Um, James in the chat said, have been in lots of Zoom minions, which I'm very thankful for. and. I'll, also also done a, lots of Zoom and live stream Shabbat services, which are bittersweet. I totally hear that, James. I've, I've really struggled to get into services as an online experience, although I struggle. I'm not really much of a synagogue goer except for a study in the best of times. So that's also been sort of a journey for me. Azaria shared, as far as Mishnah Collective has been my anchor, <clears throat> and has been amazing, interactive, and deeply connective. Have also been in lots of lecture style live streams that felt hollow, like they were missing the connection of community and space. Yeah, I totally feel like I've also experienced that dichotomy. Sometimes there are classes I took this year where it felt like everyone really came together and like bonded over what we were learning. And then there were other classes I was in where it was just we were 10 people who sat in the same room once a week. And for whatever reason, that uh, that human connection didn't spark for me there. I'm looking at the chat and all Say your hi. wonderful answers. Say hello, I'm shy. <laughs> um, Jason said, I've only been doing my shul Zoom minyans, occasionally Shabbat holiday services, but mostly not. Zoom minyans are short and straightforward and don't feel that different from minyans in person at my shul. Services online mostly don't work for me. 
I usually only go if I need to pray and can't make myself do it on my own. I think it is really interesting how online community sort of cuts down on the schmoozing time, which is actually my favorite part of going to synagogue. I really struggle with synagogue services, but I love after synagogue services when all the synagogue ladies come and bug me about whether I have a boyfriend or not. Um, that's actually like my favorite and most wonderful part of synagogue. And even though I've been trying to make digital community for a year now, I, I haven't quite figured out how to integrate that little flavor, but I think it can be. Um, I think it can be. So now I want to talk a little bit about the online community that I've been working on for most of this year, which is Shel Ma'ala which I talked a little bit about um, in my intro. Uh, Binya and I co-founded Shel Ma'ala at the beginning of 2020. It really started for me because even before the whole world got sick with COVID, um, I got much sicker at the start of 2020. I had a really big sort of explosion of a chronic neurological condition. Um, that sort of started keeping me housebound even before all of us were stuck in our homes. And so I wanted to, in that context, find a way to still teach Talmud. And so I taught this first very little class um, by myself, which was called Tiny Vessels. And then later, Binya offered to be my collaborator. And everything has taken off since then. So we started with that single session Talmud class. And then we were sort of searching for ways to create opportunity for community to live in between classes, because that's something I think that really defines community for me is that it's not just there when you're going, but it's present and sort of can be accessed whenever you need it. So we started a Discord server and a Facebook group. Um, and the Discord server in particular has proven to be really a really successful way, I think, for community to manifest in between classes. Um, if you're not familiar, Discord is a, a chat app. I'll be sending out a Discord link at the end of this video so everyone will learn what discord is if you click on that link um so yeah finding that way for there to be sustained community in between classes was i think really important for moving forward and thank god over the course of the year we we started with this single class of about 23 students and we ended up being able to have a multi session class series with over 40 students, which we just recently finished called Trans Girl Download 101. Um, so 2020 was a huge year for me in terms of learning about online trans and Jewish community. I was sort of amazed how many trans and queer Jews came out of the woodwork. I think living in the sort of queer Talmud social scene, I thought I must know all the queer and trans Jews that there are, uh, but I was very wrong about that. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about just a few lessons that I learned over the course of this uh, past year with Shel Ma'ala. One of the big ones that I've seen a lot of communities struggle with and that we have also struggled with is balancing access needs, which is difficult but necessary. Um, one of the ways this most comes up in trying to facilitate online community is um, in the dimension of time, because sometimes the time when we want to have our classes on the East Coast doesn't work for the West Coast or doesn't work for the UK or doesn't work for South Africa. And it's been a real challenge, I think, to find a way to sort of meet as many of those needs as possible. 
and I still don't think I don't think we've mastered it perfectly. I I usually sort of bring the attitude of doing the best thing I can to meet as many needs as I can for as many people as I can. Um, but sometimes I I don't quite figure out how to meet that, but it's a struggle that we always have to be in. At the beginning of the year of 2020, when we started Shell Ma'ala, I really felt like my role as an individual starting the community along with Binya would be like so crucial and that I would be so important to the endeavor. Um, and I'm sure I am in some ways, but um, I was really shocked with how wrong I was about that. Something that I'm going to talk about several times today during this class is that, you know, it's, it's really every person who shows up in class who defines the community that Shalma'ala is. And I think before I, I started this adventure, I had a tendency to think that the person in front of the room was the one who was responsible for the shape of the community exclusively, and that whether I showed up or stayed home or shared my insights or didn't um, was just sort of didn't matter. Um, but what I found over the course of this year is that the ways in which every individual in the room show up deeply impact how the community manifests. <sighs> I really, something that's been really challenging for me to, a skill that's been challenging for me to learn is to try and ask ahead of time and listen ahead of time with regards to what people need out of a community. I think definitely I've experienced in both online and offline communities that there can often be an assumption that we know what people need in advance, especially with access needs. People are people assume like, oh, transcription, of course, will be best or oh, ASL interpretation, of course, will be best. But every class and every community is is made up of people with their own access needs that it's actually in in my experience better to go to the community and ask what they need than it is to sort of assume that you can provide the best access set of accessibility options all on your own because a lot of times things that other communities have done and and I'm sure even that we have done to try to provide accessibility end up just falling flat or even worse, actually just being inaccessible in and of themselves. Of, I know there's a split opinion on this, but a great example is um, automatic captioning can be a real struggle. And I think a lot of communities come to the table with assumptions about automatic versus manual captioning and which one is better. And um, that's something that I think has required a lot of dialogue with the individuals who are using the captioning in our in our community. <sighs> okay, I want to take a break from me talking so much and hear some more from you guys. Um, one thing that I'm really curious about is whether you all think that online community will continue to receive the kind of attention it has during COVID after the pandemic is over. This is a concern that was very alive for me when we started Shell Ma'ala because I, my whole life, I have either been living in a rural area or very disabled or both. And I've always felt that we, the entire Jewish people needed more robust online community. And so part of what I was hoping to serve when we started Shel Ma'ala was to create a community that would for sure be there even when everyone else started going offline again. If you wanna drop your opinions on this question in the chat, 
I love to hear them. I realize I didn't actually say that instruction. Mayim says, I seriously doubt it. These things weren't available when only disabled or geographically people needed them, geographically isolated people needed them. I don't expect most of it to stay once non-disabled and geographically connected people no longer need it. I'm already seeing the rollback of things like remote work accommodations. Yeah, I that's definitely a concern of mine as well. I think not, it's a concern for me, both in terms of will institutions continue to provide opportunities like they have. And also for me, it's a concern about, you know, will people who have other options choose to only go to their in-person options? You know, to me, I, I worry about losing a part of our community um, to the, to real life, so to speak. I worry about, <clears throat> you know, missing students once, once online becomes less the focus for everyone. I think it's, I've been in the situation several times of moving away from a place that had great Jewish community and that feeling of like losing those institutions was so visceral for me. And I'm, I feel a lot of fear about ever, about experiencing that again, about online learning and, and community opportunities. Julie says, a lot of infrastructure has been built to accommodate online communities. So a lot of that is going to remain, especially if interest in them continues. Therefore, I think we can, can can expect to continue beyond what we've seen in the past. Thanks for that, Julie. I'm, re I'm really hopeful on that point as well. I, <clears throat> I think that's another one of those instances where, you know, how we show up will, will continue to really shape the Jewish future, whether we're organizers of online communities or not, you know, our choice to give our time and attention to online instances of Judaism, I think will be a really big um, factor in, in whether online Judaism continues to be the sort of fertile space that it is right now. Jason says, I know my job is planning to continue at least partially remote long-term, but I don't know that my shul would continue to make services and minyanim available to people who can't show up in person. I really hope we do. I'm just not sure we will. But I also thought we wouldn't have a laptop on the bima so our rabbi could be the sole person in the building on Shabbat for Zoom services. So there's no good reason we can't continue to have virtual participation in services. I love that. I mean, I think a lot of people have had laptops on their bima, but I never thought about that image <laughs> until just now, and I really love it. While we're in this moment and, and more things are dropping into the chat, I want to say something I intended to say earlier, which is that this is my first time ever both giving this workshop and giving a workshop of any kind at any convening or conference. So you all are part of a grand experiment for me. And I hope, um, you know, I hope it's it's wonderful for you. It's a It's a big sort of, I feel like I'm learning about this as I'm doing it. So I appreciate all of your willingness to go on this adventure with me. Emily says, I agree with Julie. I think there are folks who prioritize global communities rather than in person. Online Judaism is fertile. I think we will see hybrid models. Ezra says, I think there will be people online attending at in-person events, but the online attendees will tend to be overserved and underlooked but maybe people will start thinking of ways to counteract that. Yeah, I definitely, I I'm definitely can see that kind of situation developing, Ezra. I, you know, even before the pandemic, there were quite a few shuls who did like live streaming services, which were very sort of non-participatory. Um, and I can see us going back to a more widespread version of that, which would be quite sad for me because I love the plethora of things I get to have access to right now. 
Josephine says, in the traditional world, I don't see any real return to online religious ritual, which couldn't really happen anyway. Last Pesach was 73 hours of me gazing at my navel by myself. But people have come to expect that non-Shabbat restricted things will be live cast. So Britot funerals and the like will be live streamed a lot more and people will focus on that. So I'm going to talk about some conceptual things that I think I hope will be important for the future of building trans and queer Jewish community online. So the first one of these terms is one that I use a lot, which is online first, um, which is how we refer to Shel Ma'ala. We've, it's called an online first queer yeshiva. So to me, online first is a mentality of prioritizing online content and experiences over in person. So to me, this is not necessarily, even though we're seeing a sort of huge expansion of online content and opportunities to me about 90 percent of those opportunities are sort of in person adapted for online you know they're from synagogues that normally meet in person that then are switching to online um which is i'm enjoy having access to those experiences but i think they I think online Jewish community deserves the full focus and attention of the people building that community. And I'm sure not in ev in every case that's not possible, but I think for us to get where we need to go with online community, uh, as far as to become better at it as a people, we have to actually devote our full attention to it and not sort of treat it like you know, I don't know, just this sort of leftover thing that we're doing because we have to. I think it's really important because as several people have already mentioned on here, disabled people and rural people, along with other people, have needed accessible, reliable content for a long time. You know, I, before I moved to New England and had access to several Jewish institutions, um, I'm originally from Texas and there was like nothing there. Even I lived in a pretty big city and there were no Jewish institutions that I had access to. And to have the kind of content we have now would have made a world of difference for me in the early parts of my Jewish journey. Um, I think that In a lot of ways, I think online community is where Judaism is going, whether we like it or not. And other co communities that meet in person can either get with it or get left behind, um, which is maybe a, I don't mean it to be such a harsh way to put it. But I think that even before the pandemic, online Jewish community was was growing more and more more places were looking into creating online options and that that this was sort of an inevitable situation that was accelerated by by circumstances as they are now so another concept i want to talk about and this one i think is if you only think about one thing from this workshop ever again, this is, I think, the most important and interesting concept um, is this idea of, of critical yeast, which is a term that was coined by John Paul Lederich, an American professor of international peace building at the University of Notre Dame. So critical yeast is <clears throat> this sort of framework of trying to think about how social change happens. It's, it's a popular idea to think that social change is about critical mass. So we often think that once enough people want something to happen, that sort of like tilts the balance. And that's how we, that's how things change in the world. But critical yeast is this 
framework that exists sort of in opposition to that <clears throat> that starts with this idea that it's not so much about having a critical mass but it's more like the uh yeast in your bread dough which uh, uh, we shouldn't even be talking about this this week um but you know i guess you're allowed to have comments in your audible comments um but yeah it's sort of this idea that um it's more like the yeast in your bread dough, which is compared to the volume of dough, an incredibly small amount. Um, you know, it, it doesn't make up a, a, a lot of mass of the dough. And yet because of the nature of the yeast and because of the conditions it's existing in, um, it, it causes that entire dough to rise and to transform. <laughs> critical baking powder. I think we're allowed to benefit from conceptual yeast. <laughs> I see a lot of disagreement with my choice to talk about yeast, but I will not repent. Um, so some of the important principles here are smallness has nothing to do with potential. I think for online community and for um, for communities and for individuals, this is but an important principle to hold to heart. You know, I think the the size of a community doesn't necessarily determine the kind of impact that community can have. Um, I think a lot of us are used to assuming that you know it's really only the big jewish institutions that can sort of shape where we're headed as a people you know they're the ones who at the end of the day they decide where the money goes they decide what the big events are um but i think that's that's very not true i think little small communities like shelma Allah and and like other small communities especially because of our flexibility have an enormous potential to sort of be on the the edge of where Jewish community is going. Another principle of critical yeast that I think is really beautiful and important is that growth requires warmth and sweetness. So if you want your yeast to rise your dough, it needs something to eat, which is often sugar in recipes and it needs an appropriate environment which is warmth so this for me is sort of talking about on a communal level it reminds me that i want to do everything i can every day to try to make shoma Allah and every community i'm in um like a, a warm and sweet place you know and and some things like that are able to happen structurally um you know i think attending as best we can to access needs is an example of how to make an environment warm and sweet um i think every interaction i have with a student every time i answer an email every time i respond to a comment on twitter I'm sort of pre presented with an opportunity to create a warm and sweet environment with how I respond to people. And I think that's not, it's an opportunity that not just community leaders, whatever that means, have, but also all of us who all participate in different communities have the opportunity to sort of contribute to that warm, sweet environment and how we show up in space determines how how warm and sweet it is. Azaria said, celebration and gratitude are both sweeteners that enhance community in my experience. I absolutely agree. And I love that you brought that in. I think, uh, I, this is maybe uh, spicy to say of us, but as a people, I think we can be pretty grouchy and negative and that's fine. I love that about us. I'm a true, east coast broad and i really rep that kind of judaism 
and also sometimes we have to learn how to temper that a little bit in the ways that we show up in communal space. And finally, the, the last principle of critical yeast that I think is really important is don't forget to preheat the oven. So this for me is, is talking about how you think about time scale in community building. There is a, a place it's very easy to get into when you're trying to build community where it feels like you can only deal with what's on your desk right, like right now at this exact second but in order to in order to bake a good loaf of bread you heat the oven before you're ready to put the loaf in and i think in order to build beautiful online jewish community you sort of have to be thinking ahead as to how your actions now can create the environment for the bread to be baked in the future and as a from a communal organizational perspective for me this year it's looked like you know at the start of 2021 i started thinking about like what do i want shelma Allah to do this year like what do i want to happen what kinds of interactions do i want to see what kind of new things do i want to integrate and as an individual showing up in communities that are not necessarily organized by me I think it felt like just viewing my own actions in a wider time scale than just this year, this lifetime. But we talk about this a lot in Judaism. I think that we're, you know, we're part of this sort of semi eternal chain of tradition. And I think it's important to see the way we show up every day in community as something that will determine what those further links of tradition look like down the line i think it's it's easy to it's i've said already but it's easy to believe that how we show up as individuals if we're not the leaders is not a defining factor but i sort of takes everyone to get the get the ball over the finish line so to speak so i'd love if people would be willing to share in the chat if anyone here has done or seen something like critical yeast behavior or even something you think is like an example from current events or the news um i'll start with um some critical critical yeast that i thought was really cool that i got to see a long time ago um which was when I was teaching in prisons in Washington State, um, there were a lot of, it's a, it's, I'm having to formulate this story in my head because there's parts of it that I can and can't share, but ultimately the story is shareable. Um, there were a lot of conditions, obviously in prison that the incarcerated people were really discontent with. Um, and, one of those things had to do with um, yard time. So one of the units that I taught in was an incredibly high security unit where the incarcerated people were getting no yard time at all during their entire multi-year stay, which means they weren't going outside ever during the course of any day. And, um, you know, just one student out of a, I think it was a, almost a 400 person unit sort of started circulating this idea of agitating to get more yard time in the unit and that affected people both both inside the unit and out you know they they asked us as people on the outside to sort of get the word out for them and they also um were sort of Agitating. I mean, they ended up organizing a, a labor stoppage in the prison. They did the the prison's laundry and ended up organizing a labor stoppage of the laundry and ultimately ended up winning more yard time. But from the beginning, it was really just one or two people who were really enthusiastic about that issue in the unit. And I think without those one or two people, it wouldn't have 
nothing would have ever sort of fermented in that situation. No loaf would have ever risen. And I got, thank God, I got to contribute by providing some warmth and sweetness, both by providing a space in class where people were able to share and by helping organize sort of parallel actions on the outside. So, you know, in the end, it, it didn't even have to be a huge majority of people in the unit who are working because there were just these individual human connections that allowed the situation to manifest. Azaria says, the Mishnah Collective community invented a tradition of thanking our favoritas when coming back from breakout groups. It wasn't said by the facilitators, but rose up from the community and now is one of my favorite moments. Well, I love that. I haven't been to the Mishnah Collective in a while, but I love both in Shema Allah and in other spaces when structural things come from below because they tend to be the best innovations of all in the community. Oh my gosh, this is a great example. I can't believe I didn't think of it. And Shelma Allah watching the Bundeshur Chavruta channel start and open really radical conversations about history and politics I have no background on has been amazing. So in the Shelma Allah Discord server, um, at the beginning, I sort of, from above, created a bunch of different chat channels for people to participate in, sort of guessing the different things that people might want to talk about. And in the end, it turned out that one of the participants in the community proposed the idea for this Bundeshur Kavruta channel where people discuss um, Jewish leftism and a lot of other topics related to that, um, that I never would have anticipated being a necessary part of the Discord server that just sort of spontaneously manifested. Um, and I hope, you know, that was... I hope in some way I contributed to the environment that allowed that suggestion to manifest, but it it really didn't come from the top down. And I think that channel has been one of the things that has made the server so active over the past year. So Feel free to keep saying anything in the chat. I know I've emphasized this point about a thousand times, but the one of the main points for me in giving this workshop is just to connect with and talk about how how each of us show up in community really matters, which I I think it can sound very um just very like simple to say that it matters, but I think part of what our tradition tries to impress upon us is that, right, like everything we do in our day matters. There's a right kind of food to eat. There's a right way to tie your shoes. Like no action that you take is sort of free from Jewish implication. And I think how we, how we show up in a Zoom meeting is, is no exception. It's very far from no exception. I think how people show up in a Zoom meeting, what they share in the chat, uh, how they choose to engage with one another, and also how they choose to engage with one another offline really determines the tone of that community and determines, like we were talking about earlier, whether that group generates the the human connection that we're all, I think, sort of looking for in this time and, and in all times. Um, this whole journey, especially and in including this workshop, has been a huge process of experimentation and humility. I don't think that any of us are doing online community as good as we will be in a few years. I don't know if it will be as plentiful in a few years, but I think we'll be doing it a lot better both technologically and interpersonally. And that instills me with a lot of hope for the future of, of Jewish community. What I'm really hoping to see in the future is that more online first institutions and communities continue to multiply and thrive and 
God willing, get funded by those bigger institutions that are out there. I think I've seen that online community offers a lot of trans people to get together in ways that are not possible anywhere else, especially taking into account sort of the global community of trans people. Um, you know, I, when I lived in the South, I was much more isolated from trans community than I am now. And, and online community was the only place I could go for that. I think trans people have always sort of um, had a strong emphasis on online community since it's been possible. And I think this form of community, which trans and queer people are sort of at the forefront of creating and imagining, is really going to define what the future of Judaism looks like. So as a final share, I want to talk a little bit about um, what you want to see in Jewish community during the pandemic and beyond. What are some things that are lacking for you that you're hoping to see come about in Jewish community in the future? And I didn't put this on the slide, but I also want to add a secondary question of um, how do you think you can contribute to the arising of that community that you're hoping will exist in the future? So while you type some things in the chat, I'll answer this question myself. Um, I'm hoping to see more social Jewish community, like more things that are not just event-based, but actually just based around interpersonal connection. Um, and I hope, I think a way for me to contribute to that would be to, to participate in those events. I think those early participants who sort of come and are willing to take the risk on your early class or your early social hangout, they can really, they really encourage me. And, and I really hope that I can be someone at a online social Jewish event who can sort of encourage whoever happens to be facilitating that in the future. Maim said, I'm hoping to found an online first shtibol slash lay led ritual space and community, looking for people who wanna work on this with me. This would hopefully be a social space as well. Zarya says, I want to see reciprocity between online and in-person spaces. Online spaces that help find and build local relationships and in-person spaces to direct that direct to online spaces with broader perspectives than are locally available. Yeah. Yeah, I ha I I had a really wonderful chance to experience that with the class that I did in collaboration with the local shul, but I haven't seen so much so much of that kind of uh reciprocity happening but i think it would be great to see i think one of the problems we have right now is that every synagogue in the world is trying to create their own jewish uh, online community everyone's trying to invent the wheel at the same time with regards to online jewish community and something i would like to see is actually some more focus and mutual support between those areas. Some people who are focusing on online community, some people who are focusing on in-person, and then to see those sort of parallel layers of institutions supporting each other. Noah said, continued virtual events so disabled Jews can still participate. I agree. I hope many virtual events continue to happen in the future and i hope they just continue to expand in scope and become even more wonderful yes mayim that would be okay um feel free to drop your email in the chat for anyone who wants to connect about the shtibol um i didn't make a slide for this but i have about five extra minutes um i'm curious if anyone has any questions or opinions that they would like to share on this topic, feel free to drop a question in the chat or just if there's something you feel I haven't addressed, uh, drop it in there.
while that's happening, I'll just do this thing, which is to say, thanks everyone for coming to this class. Ooh, a question. How do you evaluate the need for a particular online space? Do you decide what to focus on? Um, part of the reason when I started Show Ma'ala, I felt like I was creating the thing that I needed. So that was a big influence for me was just creating the thing that, that I want. And in the future, I think I usually try to actively ask the group who I'm hoping will be served by an online space, like, uh, you know, to go and ask like, oh, would you all want to have a class about this? I think sometimes it's hard. Sometimes the groups are too big to be able to query an entire group, but even to just talk to a few members of that group has been really informative. Um, so Mayor asked if we met IRL first. Yes, Binya and I met in real life first. Um, I swiped right on her on Tinder, literally as I was flying in the plane to Providence, Rhode Island on the on-flight Wi-Fi. Um, so that is the origin story. Um, I am gonna go ahead and have uh, Rabbi Marisa drop a link to our Discord server in the chat. So if you want to join the Shelma Allah Discord server and hang out and talk with other trans Jews who really like Talmud and come to our future classes, or just see what the hell Discord is, um, you can click on that link and join our Discord server and there will be an introduction channel where you'll be asked to put in an introduction about yourself. And then after that, you'll have access to see all the channels where all the conversations and such happen. And finally, uh, you know, you can also go listen to my Talmud podcast. Hi, how are you on all major podcast platforms? Uh, it's pretty OK, I think. I hope you all would enjoy it. I just posted an episode today all about the biblical phoenix. Uh, and how big and buff it is in the Bible. So um, if you're interested in learning about super buff mythological birds, it could be the podcast for you. Um, yeah, I think that's all that I have to offer right now. Thanks everyone for coming on this big experimental journey with me. And I hope to see you around the trans digital community. Woo! Amazing oh. job, Chava. Love you. Love you. Thank you, everyone, for the digital applause. Y'all were a wonderful, wonderful class to have. I really appreciate your presence. I hope you all have a great, oh, I'll be on a podcast panel later. So if you come to trans Jewish podcasting, I'll also be there. So maybe I'll see some of you later. <laughs>